back to episode two of this series. I'm Peter Davison of International Food Management, and again, I'm welcoming David Borkwell, MD of Borkwell Consulting. Today, we're going to talk about process mapping. Um, we touched on process mapping in the last episode, David. Um, let's sort of cover procedures and things and replace procedures, but let's get into the detail. What, what's, what's good about them? Okay, well, I think one of the interesting points is that in a way, understanding the difference between procedures and process maps is the first important step. The reason that's important is because we, get, we easily get confused between what is a procedure, what is a process, what is a process map, what is a procedure, what is documented, what is not documented. And I think that's probably the root of the problem in most management systems. So management systems representatives misunderstand them. But I think there's also an issue there with regards to some of those organisations that actually visit companies and pass comment and interpretation okay. and provide uh, comment on compliance with regards to ISO 9000. Okay. So let's make that let's make that clarity clear. Let's let's tell everyone. Okay. Well, I think a process map is, as we did explain in the first episode, just to recap, is our opportunity to identify activity steps, to collect groups of activities together, to formulate processes. So we need to structure our approach. We need to think about top level processes, we need to think about sub level processes. Now to produce something which is, again I used this term earlier, but a holistic system, we need to try to visualize our management system. So we think about trying to create a structure, something we can visualise. It's quite simple, really, to get it in our minds. But very simple terms. The customer rings up, we do something in the middle, we chuck it out the other end. To bring it more complicated. And all that does is it just is simplifying figure one in the standard in ISO 9000, and 2008, and 2000. But to take that into more detail, at the front end, when I say the customer rings up, we've got business planning, we've got materials ordering, we've got maybe warehousing of raw materials, we've got goods received and goods checking, we've got a whole series of things, we've got customer focus going on right at the very beginning. Right at the very end when I say we chuck it into the other end, we've got audit, we've got checking of uh, non-conformance, we've got corrective action, we've got management review, customer satisfaction going on there as well. And in the middle, so we just do what we do. We're doing what we do is our business. So trying to think about what drops out of that is a whole series of process maps that, that reflect exactly what we do. And they're going to, of course, get wider and wider, that set of process maps, as we, as we progress down the stack. And the number of process maps that would be produced, of course, would be subject to the size, scale, and complexity of the organisation. So certain process maps are applicable to some and not others. But what we then need to recognise is something called uh, support processes processes that aren't about product or service realisation. They're things like document control, control of records. Now, we might choose to produce a process map as an alternative to, to one of the uh, six procedures, and there's more procedures required in uh, 14,000 and 18,000 reports. But one of the interesting things is, of course, that often it's best to do the events and say, well, I've got a process map for records control, but I've also got a more detailed procedure behind that, just to show the substance of it, just in case we get that pedantic urgency on uh, one of those unfortunate days. But what will the process map, how will it benefit my employees? What do they get out of it better? The psychology of the process map, of course, is, is as we said in the first episode, is to stay focused uh, on the process and the process steps. And there's a lot of psychology in this, and uh -huh. part of that is to actually Try to get into our mind. What do we need to put in? We don't want loads of symbols and boxes and pieces of paper that we stretch from ceiling to floor. What we try to do is to try to connect with the brain. What do people, what do the users of the processes really want? What do they focus on first? And an interesting concept is there's a newspaper. You take any any newspaper and what, what do we first see? You take any any newspaper and what, what do we first see across this newspaper? We see the, the, the pictures. We see the stars, we see the face, we see the head, and we see the big words. And then the brain starts to think about what the small words say underneath that. And that's a natural human thing. 
So the same with any picture. What, what do we do? We take this, we look at the car first, then we look at the big words, then we look at the small words in that order. Think about our process now. What do we do? We could put some pictures relating to that particular uh, work area, such as goods inwards. So what does it happen when the process map opens up? We see pictures, real pictures of, of goods inwards and the warehouse and delivery and checking. And what the brain's being told there is that's what I'm, I'm going to learn about. That's what I'm going to see. So the process steps then give me the wordy detail. But of course, going across the page gives us the opportunity to identify uh, responsibilities. It gives us room underneath the process steps to put responsibilities. And critical control points are a key part of these process maps because if we don't recognize the need to identify critical control points. Well, when I say critical control point, I mean a key step, a something must happen, a form needs to be filled in. So we hyperlink the form or we, uh, we spell out in the box that something, an approval has to happen. Uh, we have to check goods received because there may be some external subcontracted work that's taken place on the product or some external service that we buy in. Now this is a big change that you're suggesting. So the viewer is going to be a little bit up in the air at the moment. You can see they're thinking the man's going all over the place. So do we have any examples that we could Yeah, show what people? we can do is we can we can show a, a slide here, I guess, of a typical um, of a typical process map for uh, product or service area and then one for one of these support processes. Mm -hmm. So just take a few seconds and have a look at these and we'll try and zoom in on them as well. Okay, maybe that just gave you a little bit of an insight into uh, into what we're talking about here. But I think it's important to, to, to think about these process maps, not just as flat pages, uh, not just as another gimmick. Actually, this was introduced nine years ago. And I think really uh, the opportunity was presented to business eight, nine years ago. And I think where the gap is, is that organisations and even some some certification uh, organisations uh, haven't really picked up on the point. I think it's a real shame because there's golden opportunity here for organisations to go lean, to go mean, to go process focused, to connect with their objectives and targets, and make sure that their management systems demonstrate and deliver continual improvement. So David, you've got us all very excited now, we're all wanting to do this, so where do we go in episode three? Okay. Well, I think the only way we can really explain this in more detail now is uh, we've actually produced a, a video of a, of, a, of a live online system. So it'd be a good idea if, uh, if you take the time. Thanks for watching, but um, we've put a link in shortly at the end of this particular episode. If you uh, if you come back to us on that link, which is an email address, we'll actually send you the link to uh, to a video which shows you around a live system. Okay, thank you. Thank you.